Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know uh, we did introductions in the Bible class, but uh, several of you had not been there. So let me do a, an abbreviated uh, introduction. My name is Joe Hall. Uh, I live up in the Hickory area, not very far from you guys, in a little small town called Claremont, right between Hickory and Statesville. And I'm on the board of directors for Agape in North Carolina. We are uh, an agency that works with trying to get foster children from the Department of Social Services into the families of Christians. And one of the primary goals of Agape is evangelism. Because what happens to these children when they're being raised by godly families? They're being evangelized. They're being taught about Jesus. They're being taught about God. They're being taught about how to live a righteous life. And that's what we're talking about. I spent about 20 years in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, I remember when I was stationed in McConnell Air Force Base up in Kansas, which has by far been my favorite assignment. Loved it there. Uh, we got a call from the Department of Social Services that uh, we had signed up for foster care, and they had a two-month-old baby that was going to be uh, put in our home. Well, my wife fell in love with that baby immediately, and the rest of us quickly fell in love with the baby also. And it turned out that my uh, daughter, Kimmy is her name, uh, had three other siblings in another home. And I thought, oh, that is such a shame. <laughs> I mean, we were so interested in adopting Kimmy, and I thought, it's just not going to happen if she has three other siblings in another home. Well, it wasn't long before my wife started scheming about getting all four of them in our house. And she got all four of them in our house, and uh, it was uh, quite a challenge. Uh, they were wild. They were four, three, two, and one. And we went from four people in a house to eight people in a house. And uh, believe me, that uh, was quite a challenge. But that was, uh, my goodness, 19 years ago. They're all grown up now. And uh, I think the reason my wife and I got interested in adoption and foster care was primarily because of the example that my mom and dad provided us. Uh, they were godly men, uh, man and woman. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about my family, and I'm going to try to use biblical concepts and biblical scriptures to kind of explain to you a thought process on the issue of adoption, the biblical concept of adoption. James 1, 27 says, as was read earlier, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. To watch and take after orphans is what we're talking about this morning. My mom and dad had an tremendous impact on me. And in 1978, this young lady by the name of Kim Young Oak from Korea was adopted by my mom and dad. Now, Kim, in this picture is about three or four years old. We don't really know her birthday, uh, so we've had to make some guesses. Or we used her adoption day as her birthday. And Kim has been a great blessing to this family. Uh, in fact, when she came over, she, she brought uh, lice with her, and my, my, my uh, mom and my sister caught it, and uh, we just laugh about it today because that's just one of the blessings she brought with her when she came over. And this is our uh, adoption story. Uh, as you see here, I have six kids, the two younger ladies there uh, are named uh, Samantha or uh, Shannon and Casey. Uh, Casey uh, is a registered nurse now. Uh, Shannon is uh, married with three kids. Her husband is a, a football coach. Uh, he played Middle Tennessee State University linebacker, so he's a big guy. If I ever wanted to try to intimidate him, I had to get up on a stool and look in his eyes. You know, He's a big guy. But uh, the other daughters, other kids uh, right here, you'll notice this is RJ. This is Samantha. This is Nikki. And this is Kimmy. This is about three years after our adoption. And here they are, all grown up. RJ right there uh, works in furniture. Uh, he works at a furniture company. 
uh, trying to get him to go to college, but he just hasn't made that decision yet. Uh, but he has the ability if he, if he would like to. This young man right there is named Nicholas. Nick is a cavalry scout in the Army. He drives tanks. He, he can shoot uh, the eye out of a needle at 300 yards. Uh, he can run 10 miles with a pack on his back. Uh, he is a, a, quite a, a specimen physically. He, he's able to do things that I would never, ever think about doing in, in the military. That's why I went into the Air Force, so I wouldn't have to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> this is Samantha. She's in the Army National Guard now. Uh, she is married to her husband, who is also in the Army. Uh, they have a little child. His name is uh, Elijah, and they're in down Fort Stewart. And this young lady right there, her name is Kimmy, the overachiever. Kimmy is a squad, was a squadron commander in her high school class. She was honors, a basic tradie, top three in her advanced training and medical, uh, uh, be a medic in the Army. And if she goes into active duty in the military, I will be saluting her someday. <laughs> she is quite an overachiever. So, and she was the two-month-old when, when we got her. So, how can we help our orphans? Well, obviously adoption and fostering their son, but let me, we're gonna talk a bit about that, but let's talk about the mother wounds. Sometimes we are guardians of, uh, in, in Bunker Hill High School, where I teach JRTC, a lot of the kids live with guardians, uh, kids that aren't their mother and fathers, but are guardians. Uh, mentoring, uh, big brothers, big sisters. There's actually a big brothers, big sisters program here in Charlotte. When I was in college, I was a big brother of a young man, young man named Alan. Uh, his wife will tell you that uh, our relationship for about 10 years actually made such a big difference in his, relation, or his life that uh, she feels that that relationship we had and his relationship with my mom and dad, my, he would go on vacations with my mom and dad, uh, made a big difference in his life. In fact, I, I to this very day, think my mama uh, loved him more than she loved me. That's what I think. <laughs> Then we have older women teaching younger women, older women teaching children. And something that I think uh, older women and older men should think about the fact that a lot of times young boys and young girls don't have grandparents. I know being in the military, we traveled all over the place. So sometimes the older men and the older women had an opportunity to be grandparents to my children. And that's an op often or a way to uh, help uh, children who need, need those contacts. But let's talk about adoption and the scriptures. In the Galatians 4, 5, it talks about to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And then God sent Jesus to redeem the lost. He came back into this world to redeem us from being sent and being lost because of our sins. He came back to buy us back, to give deliverance to us, to regain possession of the very beginning of time when Adam and Eve sinned, and so that he could call his children his children again. And as adopted parents, in a real sense, we are redeeming children by paying money, by paying time, emotional investment in children that are lost and have little hope. That's right. That is what we're doing. We are redeeming these children out of hopeless situations. Over in Romans 8, verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you read the received the spirit of adoption by whom you we cry out, Abba, Father. God provides us a relationship with no fear, but a re relationship in which we can call him Abba, Father. In 1 John 4 and 18, it says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect fear drives out fear, or perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment so that the one who fears has not re uh, reached perfection in love. And adopted kids have a father and mother where none once existed. They have no fear. They have no fear of having no shelter, of having no food, of having no permanence. Do you realize the average foster child is moving around seven different times? It took about two or three years before my children felt that they 
we're permanently in our home and we're going nowhere. In fact, I would tell you after that two or three years, they were taking us for granted just like my other biological <laughs> children. <laughs> they knew they were home and they knew we weren't going anywhere. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We, we eagerly await for our final adoption at the return of the Lord, is what this scripture is talking about. And children with no father and no mother desperately wait for a family and to be redeemed from their current situation. I'm sorry. They are waiting. How many children are waiting to be adopted in the United States? Would you believe over 100,000? There was 100,000 kids in foster care who will not be able to go back to their families. And these 100 kids, 114,556 to be exact, are waiting for somebody to step up and give them permanence. If you notice, this young lady right here, just looking at that clock waiting for somebody to stand up and take care of them. I remember late recently I've been going through a book, The Jesus I Never Knew by uh, Philip Yancey. And he was talking about the sheep and the goats, and he was talking about the fact that one of the primary missions of the kingdom of God is to take care of the poor to take care of those who are in need. And it just hit me as I was reading uh, Phil Pianti's book that that's exactly what we're trying to do when we take care of kids who need to be adopted. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took me care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. I shared with the Bible class that my four children's parents were actually in prison uh, with uh, their parents. Uh, when we've gone through the termination hearing, they actually literally brought Roger and Angel into the courtroom in their orange jumpsuits and chains. And so when we were helping visit, when I was in prison and you visited me, I was really helping them by helping their children because they were in prison. And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of the brothers of mine, you did for me. Amen. And this has a clear application and an opportunity for us to take care of the poor and who is less than poor than children who have no ability to take care of themselves. Well, you know what? There's some actually pretty famous people out there who have been adopted. Eddie Murphy. Steve Jobs, John Lennon, Marilyn Monroe, Aristotle, Nancy Reagan, Newt Gingrich. You can read the list there. There's lots of people who have actually have uh, been adopted and been very successful in life because somebody stood up and helped take care of them. Now I'd like you to think about your legacy, putting a stamp on the future and making a contribution to future generations. I read this in the paper the other day, and it really kind of uh, made me think. It was by Christian Limbaugh Bloom. And her title of her article was, In the Decades of Ahead, Become Part of a Legacy That Matters. And she writes, But the Bible's depiction of legacy reaches far beyond only one person. As I reread the story of Abraham this past week, I realized God's design for human legacy totally shatters our small view of this world. And we should be setting our, heights much, our sights much higher. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, had no idea how God's plan would come to fruition. But they decided to put their trust in his promise because of their faith and their willingness to be used by God. He made them part of the greatest legacy in history. Amen. And when we take these children into our homes, we are setting up a legacy that will long outlive us. Here's an example of this legacy that I'm talking about. The, the descendants of an atheist and a Christian. 
Many of you may have seen this. Uh, many of you may not have. Max Cheeks, Descendants and Legacy. He was an atheist. He, when he died, they went back and they researched his, his family history. And they found out that he, he had in his family history over 310 who died poor. 150 were criminals. Seven were murderers. 100 were drunkards. Half were prostitutes. And 540 descendants cost the state over $250,000 because he didn't treat... Uh, he didn't raise his children as Christians. In contrast to that, Jonathan Edwards, his descendants, and his legacy is 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, three U.S. senators, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 military officers, 100 preachers, 60 authors, and many other famous or uh, very successful professions. Your legacy will be what you raise your children to be. Larry Billard, or Ballard says, these contrasting legacies provide an example of what some call the five-generation rule. How a parent raises their child, the love they give, the values they teach, the emotional environment they offer, the education they provide, the influences not only their children, but the four generations to follow, either for good or evil. What a challenge throughout, or challenging thought. If someone studied your descendants four generations later, what would you want them to discover? Do you want an Edwards legacy or a Jukes legacy? The life you live will determine the legacy you leave. I know for sure that if we hadn't adopted RJ, Nikki, Samantha, and Kimmy, that RJ and Nikki would probably be in jail by now. And I know for sure that Samantha and Kimmy would probably already have two or three babies of now. But that's not how we raised them. We raised them in light of what the scriptures teach them to do as a Christian. Amen. And RJ's struggling. I'll be honest with you. He's struggling. But the other three are going to be totally successful in life. And their children are going to be successful in life. And their children's children are going to be successful in life. Because they were raised in a Bible believing family. Amen. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about families fostering and taking children in and potentially adopting these children and teaching them about God and evangelizing. And that's what we're about. Aren't, is that not true, brothers and sisters? Amen. It is. It's exactly what we're talking about. Come on. And that could be your legacy. In fact, this is my mom and dad's legacy. Of all the families you see here, this is my dad, and that's my mom. They have 15 grandchildren up there, and biologically, only six of them belong to them. The rest of them are through adoption and foster care. But that is their legacy. So what is the purpose of this lesson today? I want you to help stop the train wreck we call our broken kids. And how do we do that? We do that through taking these kids out of broken homes and broken situations and broken environments where they cannot succeed. Now, there are some kids who can succeed. My mom or my dad, as I told you, uh, was, lived pretty much in an orphanage and broke uh, 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 home uh, when he was starting about three or four years old. Has, has issues today about getting close to people because he never got close to anybody because he never had any friends that he knew would be around him for very long. They would come and go and come and go. But when he was nine years old, he decided he wasn't going to live like that the rest of his life. Went into the Army, got his GI Bill, became a CPA, became a, a, a lawyer, tax law. He was successful in life. But not most kids can do that. Most kids live in generational poverty. I have kids in my class at JROTC who are extremely poor, and I know that if they don't do something different, they are going to maintain that lifestyle. Unfortunately, you know, 
There's not much I could do about that other than trying to influence them at the school. But there is something you could do. There is something that you could do. You could think about fostering. You could think about adoption. You could think about helping those kids. And could you be the answer to some child's prayer? That's the question. Could you be a foster child or foster parent, an adopted parent, maybe a respite parent, somebody who takes children in on a temporary basis while the regular foster children parents or adopted parents had to go out of state or couldn't take them with them and things like that. I remember one time when we were in Kansas, we had to go back to Virginia where my parents lived and the state wouldn't let us take Kimmy out of the state. So a family came and they provided respite care for Kimmy for two weeks. And we came back and, and, and brought her back into the home. So, what are some lessons learned we can get from this? One, you know, is the fact that short sermons are nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my brother, my brother's a preacher up in Winston Salem, and we have to tell him he likes to go forty-five minutes, and we tell him no, Perry, thirty minutes, Perry, thirty minutes, and he always asks me, well, when was I? Well, how, how long did I go today? I said, did good, brother. You did thirty minutes today. But uh, I'm just kidding with you guys. Let me conclude with this, this, this thought. I remember one time I was kidding with my youngest daughter, Kimmy. Uh, and I, I, I love to kid with my kids. And I said to Kimmy, you know, Kimmy, you know how much more money your mother and, ha and I would have if we hadn't adopted you guys? <laughs> I was kidding. Just remember that. Okay. Some of you are thinking, whoa, getting the daggers out. Okay. And she said to me, Dad, if you hadn't adopted us, you wouldn't have had a life. <laughs> it's true. I admit it. <laughs> you know, I'd be an old grandpa with not much to do if I didn't have those kids. You know, and They've been a lot of fun. They've been challenges. I remember one time my youngest, or, or my second youngest son, or my second youngest son, you know, the one I told you was a Calvary Scout. Well, just remember the kind of stuff he loves doing. He got this uh, truck, it was, a, it was an older truck, and I told him, you gotta take care of this truck, because if you don't take care of it, you know, uh, you know it's, it's just not gonna last very long. Well, two weeks later, his truck was in the middle of a mud field, completely stuck, and it took us three days to get it out. <laughs> you know, they don't always do what you tell them to do, but they are a lot of fun. And although I was mad for him for days after that, I'm laughing about it. And that's pretty true with most things that we do with our kids. We get mad at them. We instruct them. They do things bad. They make us proud. And what we're talking about is life. We're talking about life. And not every kid is going to be uh, a, a, a complete success of what you think should be a complete success. I remember one time I was talking to a friend of mine who was a colleague, she was a chief nurse at uh, a medical cl clinic I was at, and uh, she was doing something very similar to what I was doing. She had uh, four adopted children that she was adopting rather later in life. Uh, they were in their teens and, and uh, eight, nine, 11, 12, something like that. And I was telling her, you know, my kids were going to be successful, they were going to go to college, they were going to do all this stuff and things, and, and she said her goal for her kids was to stay out of jail. You know what? I learned a lot from that comment. Because sometimes kids are so beat up, so in such a way of life that they don't have hope, that the best thing we can do for some of them is to keep them out of jail. And that is a wonderful goal, to keep them out of jail, to keep them you know, where they can succeed in life. It doesn't have to be what I think I would like to do to succeed in life, but if they're, they are faithful to the Lord, they have a job, they're out of jail, <laughs> I mean, that is a successful life, is it not? Amen. And that's what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. Some of you may be interested in, in taking a baby in. Maybe, I, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm, I'll be 60 years old this year. If I was to foster or adopt, it'd be a teenager for sure, okay? Uh, 
but this is your opportunity. As I told you, uh, my, my daughter said that we wouldn't have had a life if we hadn't adopted. And I'm suggesting to you, as an invitation, that you wouldn't have a life either if you're not a Christian. You may have a life that you think you're enjoying, right. but I'm suggesting that you're going to have a much more enjoyable life because you're going to have brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to have a father in heaven. You're going to have uh, a future. And you're going to live by life principles that will help you be successful in life. That's what we're talking about. So as we stand and sing, please come forward if you have anything that we can help you with. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Yeah.